Okay, why don't we uh, 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 get started? Um, we have a good number of people on the line now. Uh, welcome to Grand Rounds today, May 18th, 2021. Um, we're focusing on GI cancers today, challenges and um, opportunities. And um, we'll hear from two members of that newly formed center. It was actually the first uh, official disease center that we formed. And um, it's fitting that we, we have these two speakers um, and what we'll do is we'll have each speak for 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll do some questions uh, right after. So the, um, the first is uh, uh, Dr. Pam Kuntz, uh, who's Associate Professor of uh, Internal Medicine and Medical Oncology, and the Director of the Center for GI Cancers, and the, and the, uh, and the Chief of, of GI Medical Oncology. And we're really uh, fortunate to have uh, Pam here. Uh, she's been here less than a year. She moved from uh, Palo Alto, Atherton uh, to New Haven during a very tough year to travel. So we're so happy you came, Pam. Uh, she received her medical degree from Dartmouth Medical School and residency and fellowship out at Stanford. Uh, she then uh, stayed was at Stanford until she joined us in 2020. Um, at Stanford, she was the director of the Stanford Neuroendocrine Tumor Program, the leader of Endocrine Oncology Research Group, and the director of the Neuroendocrine Tumor Fellowship. As you all uh, probably know, she's an international leader in the clinical care of patients with neuroendocrine tumors. We call those NETS, N-E-T-S, and is advancing the field through clinical trials and translational research. She's got a broad investigational program, and you're going to hear today about her, uh, her plans, uh, which she's already uh, initiated to really build her own program, but more importantly, the entire GEO program here at the Yale Cancer Center Smile Cancer Hospital. So Pam, thanks for being here today and I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Roy. Um, Roy, just give me a thumbs up, but can you see my screen okay? Okay, excellent, good. Well, thank you everybody. And Roy, thank you for that kind introduction. I'm very excited to share with you our GI cancer program. But before we jump in, I just want you to save the date for a very exciting Grand Rounds in two weeks. So we, we are having our first annual Yale Center for GI Cancers visiting lectureship with Dr. Marsha Cruz Correa. She is a professor of medicine and biochemistry and the director of the GI oncology program at the University of Puerto Rico. She has held leadership roles in AACR most recently, with the Women in Cancer Research Committee, and she was the chairperson for that. The focus of her research is understanding genetic and epigenetic pathways for colorectal cancer among Hispanic patients. So we're very excited to host her in a couple of weeks. So I will be um, sharing the virtual podium today with Dr. Mandar Mazumdar, and we are excited to share with you an overview of the program and some of the goals um, Mandar will take on the scientific vision. So I'd like to start off just by recognizing that this is a, an incredible team effort. And what I will be talking about today really is the work of the entire team. It's been a pleasure to get to meet everybody, albeit mostly by Zoom over the last year. Um, but we have really tremendous team members and have started also doing some recruiting. These are my disclosures. So I will take on providing you a background on GI cancers, talking about this newly launched center, and then I'll speak about our patient care education and clinical research initiatives, and then I will pass the baton to Dr. Mazumdar. So first, just a brief background on GI cancers and aspects that make, make our center unique. So if you try to count up all of the different primary sites in the GI system, there are at least 12, depending on how you count them. And I think that poses both some challenges and some opportunities as we think about developing a center and really trying to address all of these different primary sites um, via all of the main pillars of patient education, patient care education and research. In terms of estimated new cancer cases, colon, rectal, and pancreas are in the top 10 for both men and women. However, there is a larger proportion attributed to GI cancers for estimated deaths. In fact, 27% of estimated deaths in men are due to GI cancers. That's colon, pancreas, liver, and esophageal. And for women, it's about 21%, colon, pancreas, and liver. 
We've also had a number of FDA approvals over the last 12 months. This is since May of 2020. In fact, just in the last six weeks, we've had three new FDA approvals in the immunotherapy space for advanced esophageal, GE junction, and gastric cancers that you'll see in those last three rows, Pembro plus fluoroprimidine, Nebo plus fluoroprimidine, and Pembro plus trastuzumab and fluoroprimidine. So it's been very exciting for us. GI cancers have also been in the news quite a bit in the last year, which I think has done a lot to raise awareness, which is quite important. So Chadwick Boseman sadly died at a very young age of colorectal cancer. Ruth Bader Ginsburg died of metastatic pancreas cancer. We've also seen recommendations for the colon cancer screening age to drop to age 45. And this is on the basis of a draft recommendation from the United States Preventive Services Task Force for average risk adults age um, 45 to 49 that they should start screening. This has not been put into practice just yet. So in terms of our center, um, I think Kevin Best for this slide, many of you have seen this, but um, Roy and I are in a bit of a competition. So both of our centers have launched. Um, we, were, we just edged out the thoracic center, but it's very exciting. And there are 13 more centers yet to launch. These centers, I think, as many of you know, have a shared organizational structure with a leadership cabinet. There are common roles in all the disease centers. These include the director, um, and I will be serving that position for our center, patient care services director, Maureen Major Campos, and an operations and planning director, which is Kevin Best. Um, <clears throat> I also have a scientific director, Dr. Manda Mazumdar, which I'm very excited about, and I'm currently serving an interim role as the clinical director. We also had the flexibility of adding a number of ad hoc roles specific to GI cancers. Um, we wanted all of the relevant stakeholders to have a place in this leadership cabinet. So these include surgeonc, education, cancer imaging, radonc, pathology, a network director, biorepository, advanced endoscopy, and importantly, a liaison with the GI service line. You'll see that that um, GI service line dotted line is really indicated um, to represent a bridge with our program. Dr. Mario Strazabasco has done a wonderful job building a liver cancer program over many years, and we still plan to work very closely with he and his team. In addition, we have started and launched four disease-specific programs, including pancreas, neuroendocrine, advanced hepatobiliary, and colorectal anal, and I'll speak about those in just a moment. And we have some tumor boards that match up with these, which we will also talk about. So we have um, implemented some new meetings. Um, the, yellow, the yellow star indicates things that have been um, implemented newly in the last year. So we have had an existing tumor board, but actually just yesterday we launched a split. So this is now a single hour and a half meeting, but we have an upper GI pancreas net tumor board and a colorectal anal tumor board. The liver tumor board is still on Thursdays. We have our existing DART clinical trial review, but we started a Center for GI Cancer seminar series on Thursday afternoons that consists of journal club being led by Dr. Christy Gomez, scientific talks, clinical talks, and industry pipeline talks. In addition, we've started a number of working groups and committees. This includes a GI tumor board revamp working group. This initial phase has concluded, but we will continue to meet quarterly a GI multi-D clinic working group. We started this in March and are having monthly meetings to pilot um, some multi-D clinics, which I will speak about on a later slide. We have leadership cabinet meetings and program leader meetings. So we've been quite busy. So I'll speak next about our disease programs. I want to mention some shared themes that I won't repeat on some of the specific slides. But we all envision in the pancreas, colorectal, advanced hepatobiliary and net programs to focus on these pillars. So multidisciplinary clinics, tumor boards, care coordination, really important to GI cancers is integration of palliative care. And we actually just have newly recruited Dr. Laura Baum, who is palliative care and hemong trained. She will join us this summer. In terms of education, we um, plan on expanding physician education and CME events patient education events, mentoring with shovel-ready projects for trainees, and plan an advanced fellowship in GI oncology. 
Um, for research, we hope to expand on clinical trials, specifically IITs. That's something that we need to increase in our portfolio. And I will let <clears throat> Dr. Mazumdar speak later about some of our basic and translational research efforts. And then lastly, advocacy. I'd like to think of this as the fourth pillar and um, particularly in my role as the vice chief for DEI and getting more involved with community engagement and health equity, I'd like for us to think about these aspects as we do all of our patient care education and research. So the pancreas program is being co-led by Drs. Jill Lacey and Mandar Mazumdar. And um, in terms of patient care, what I have done on these slides is underline some of the key aspects that are unique to this program. So they have planned um, a pilot pancreatic cancer multi-day clinic with a focus on non-metastatic disease. We have just recently started point of care germline testing with collaboration with Xavier Yor and his cancer genetics team, advanced endoscopy expertise. As I'd mentioned, we are embedding palliative care in our program and we have a pan pancreatic cancer early detection clinic. In terms of education, we are hoping to launch a pancreatic cancer interest group for trainees. And then in terms of community-wide efforts, we had a very successful Yale PAC seminar series this past year and a research summit um, led by Mandar. In terms of research, 50% um, of our new pancreas patients are consented into clinical trials and we have been the leading enroller in four clinical trials in the US. Between 2016 and 2019, we treated over 400 patients, 38% um, at care centers from cl on clinical trials. And we plan to grow the IIT. Samples. And um, this represents 61% of all of our biorepository samples. So that's a problem for the other diseases, which we will speak to as an opportunity. And then we also plan on leveraging innovative multiomics profiling um, on the right are some of our recent publications. The colorectal program is co-led by doctors Michael Cicchini, Xavier Yor, and Vic Reddy. In terms of patient care, we plan on developing a nurse navigator program, fully integrating genomics with patient care and developing an early age of onset colorectal clinic. In terms of education, we hope to work with stakeholders um, such as the SMILO screening program on public campaigns. This is um, especially pertinent as the US PSTF guidelines roll out for the lower colorectal cancer screening age. And then in terms of research for the colorectal program, we um, aim to enhance collection of colorectal specimen in our Yale GI biorepository and increase clinical trial enrollment, again, with IITs, and then expand the early age of onset colorectal cancer think tank. This is a um, committee that was started by Xavier Yor and Xiaomei Ma. And then lastly, our community outreach and engagement plans for colorectal with developing targeted strategies and special emphasis on underserved populations. The Advanced Hepatobiliary Program will, will link very closely with Mario Strasabosco's liver program. This is being co-led by Drs. David Madoff, Stacey Stein, and Saj Khan. And the patient care education and research plans are listed here, I would say, importantly for patient care. We um, routine tumor profiling for biliary cancers has proven in recent years to be critical in terms of therapy selection. In terms of education, we will again work closely with the liver cancer program and some of the research plans are very much in line with the other shared programmatic goals. The neuroendocrine tumor program, I will be co-leading with Dr. Darko Pukar from Nuclear Medicine. And um, from a patient care perspective, we plan on launching a pre-PRRT clinic. For those of you who don't know, PRRT is peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. The um, agent is 177 lutetium dodatate, and we plan on doing this to really streamline and provide some consistency for how our patients are getting care. In terms of education, we also plan on having more patient events, such as Smilo Cares and hopefully in person and collaborating with some of our um, nonprofit foundations. In terms of research, the biorepository is also enriched for net cases. Um, we hope to build on this. 
And then in terms of clinical trials, we have a real opportunity um, to be a key site for impactful clinical trials. In fact, we are one of five centers for a international clinical trial netter two on which I, I sit on the steering committee. Um, and there are a number of other novel peptide receptor radionuclide agents that we hope to examine in clinical trials. And we have a number of grants um, in the works um, that will hopefully start bringing together both Yale science and, and outside science. Moving on to patient care. So this data represents new patient visits from both MedOnc and Surgeonc. This does not include radiation oncology. And in our leadership um, cabinet meetings, we have started reviewing data and key performance indicators with the goal to develop a dashboard of GI cancer specific metrics. So as you can see here, this is trends over time. We certainly um, dipped and have really plateaued since the COVID pandemic, but we have bounced back. <clears throat> Um, another interesting set of data that we looked at, again, courtesy of Kevin Vest, was our Connecticut population and distribution of GI services across our service area. And I think this is helpful for us as we think about developing and um, placing services in specific locations. So as an example here in red are our GI medical oncology providers, in yellow, GI radiation oncology, and in green GI surgical oncology. So they're certainly clustered at areas of denser population. Those are in the dark blue, um, but I think there are still certainly some opportunities. Another data slide um, that I found also especially interesting as we think about sort of strategic planning is the incidence of new GI cancers across the state. We here look at colon, stomach, esophageal, liver, and pancreas. The, um, the higher rates for the state are in red, and I have kind of squares around the two disease sites where our rates are higher than the US rates. So that's true for both stomach and pancreas. And I think that's perhaps why we actually accrue so successfully to pancreatic cancer clinical trials and have a very robust clinical and research program in pancreas cancer. I'd like to also mention, um, you know, like almost everybody, um, COVID has disrupted our outpatient practice. Um, GI Medical Oncology main campus is still on the first floor of the North Haven Care Center. Um, I'd like to use this as an opportunity to really thank my nursing partners, Alian Salaroli, who is our APSM, Kathleen Moseman, and Vana Dest. Um, we have worked hard to try to make this space work for our team. There are still some challenges for sure, but we're appreciative of some of the um, small wins that we've had, such as a new counter space and putting in a four new workstations. I'll mention just briefly our GI tumor board and multi-D efforts. So as I'd mentioned yesterday, we launched our split of the GI tumor board. This was initiated due to really incredible growth in our tumor board. We had really outgrown the existing time. And this is um, really with credit due to Stacy Stein and Lauren Millette and others. And in addition, the colorectal team would like to launch the national accreditation program for rectal cancer. And in order to do so and become an accredited site, we are required to have a separate tumor board. So the upper GI, pancreas, and net tumor board will be led by Stacey Stein, and the colorectal anal tumor board is being led by Anne Anju and Hadden Pantel. Um, this is a, our actually tumor board from yesterday via Zoom. I'd like to also really take this as an opportunity to thank Lauren Millette, who does an incredible job with Tumor Board um, and the support from other leaders to make this happen. It was a little bit more complicated than I imagined, but to Kevin Billingsley, Hal Tara, David Fisher, Sonia Grizzle, and Todd Wilcox. Our multi-D clinics are a work in progress. Um, we are building on some lessons learned from an earlier colorectal cancer pilot. Um, that was done in North Haven and delayed by COVID. We have plans for two pilots, a colorectal cancer multi-D in Trumbull and a pancreas multi-D at main campus. And we have already started some smaller working groups and are meeting regularly to try to 
think about some strategic planning that, that includes some of the elements listed here, such as enhancing signature of care, aligning with our existing disease programs, aligning with local expertise and specialties, selecting an optimal location, and then later on, we will work on operational topics, workflow, being creative with telehealth, et cetera. Lastly, in the realm of patient care, I'd like to mention that our team members make important contributions to the NCCN panels. Um, our institutional representative is Susan Higgins, who sits on the NCCN Guidelines Steering Committee, and she's been very helpful, helpful with um, guidance around this. So Stacey Stein serves on the hepatobiliary panel, John Kunstman on the pancreas panel, Saj Khan on the neuroendocrine tumor panel, Jill Lacey on the esophageal gastric panel, and Kim Johong on the small bowel, colon, rectal, anal panel. So let's move on and talk about education. So I'd like to give two of our fellows a big shout out. They both just gave um, presentations last week at our fellow research retreat. And um, Dr. Timo Patel gave a presentation on clinical outcomes of first-line sulfurinox versus GEM plus NAB paclitaxel in metastatic pancreas cancer. Um, Timo is a senior fellow, will be graduating this year and has taken a job with the FDA where he will serve as a medical officer in the GI cancer review team. So in this study, um, Timmel and his mentors, Jill Lacey and Michael Cicchini, wanted to compare overall survival and time to treatment discontinuation for two main chemotherapy regimens for metastatic pancreas cancer, fulfirinox and Jebnab paclitaxel. They reviewed over 300 patients and found that patients treated with first-line fulfirinox had increased survival these patients were younger and less likely to be admitted while on treatment, and rates of treatment discontinuation due to toxicity were actually similar between the two regimens. Um, secondly, Dr. Jamie Zhang is currently on our T32 training grant, so she has one more year um, left on that. She presented on her project of MGMT expression in colorectal cancer, the immune microenvironment and response to DNA damaging agents. Her mentors are Dr. Kurt Schalper, Michael Cicchini, and Jill Lacey. And her specific aims, and I will um, not go into all of the details on her project, which are were beautifully presented by her, but the specific aims are to quantify MGMT expression in colorectal cancer cohorts and assess association of MGMT expression with DNA damage repair, adaptive tumor immune response, and overall survival. And then secondly, review some of these same characteristics in an investigator-initiated clinical trial launched by Dr. Cicchini and Timo Patel um, using temozolomide and dilaparib. So very exciting. In the realm of patient education, we tested out the Smilo Shares platform, which was actually very user-friendly and lots of fun. During Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month in March, we gave two separate presentations, one to the New Haven community and the other to the Greenwich community. And we took advantage of, again, local expertise, particularly in Greenwich. We um, collaborated with one of the colorectal surgeons at Greenwich Hospital and two of our care center medical oncologists, Dr. Lee and Dr. Boyd. So moving on to clinical research. So how does the GI DART clinical trial portfolio compare internally? And again, these are metrics that we are looking at in the course of our leadership cabinet discussions. Um, a thank you, great thank you to Christina Weiss, our CTTM. So the GI DART clinical trial portfolio is 8% of YCC's overall clinical trial portfolio. Yet it represents actually 11% of all the clinical trial accruals we approve quite well and 14% of analytic cases, indicating that we could potentially do better. 5% of the GI cancer analytic case volume accrues to clinical trials, so we are higher than the national benchmark. However, the NCI expectation is as much as 20%, so for sure an opportunity to do better. Our GI DART sponsor mix is as follows, 44% industry, 39% NCI, and 17% IIT. It, the ideal is thought to be a third, a third, a third, so we certainly would like to increase our IIT um, uh, portfolio. Our accrual trends follow the overall YCC accrual trends with a dip during COVID, and we are now starting to recover. And 
<clears throat> our accrual over the last 12 months has been heavily reliant on cooperative group studies and industry studies. And note that the numbers on this slide represent trials managed by the GI DART, but we have a number of patients that go on to other, other um, DARTs such as phase one. We are grateful and very reliant on our care center colleagues for accrual to our clinical trials. In fact, 38% of our clinical trial accruals came from our care centers between 2016 and 2019. I'd like to highlight two of our investigator-initiated clinical trials. The first here is um, PI'd by Dr. Jill Lacey. It's a phase two study of perioperative modified fulfirinox in localized pancreas cancer. It's a single arm study in which patients receive six cycles of modified fulfirinox followed by surgery, followed by six more cycles of modified fulfirinox. Um, this is actually one patient away from completing enrollment. So we're very excited about that. And I think that there will be some very interesting correlatives that come along with this. Um, Dr. Kim Johung is leading another investigator initiated trial, a phase two study to evaluate modified fulfirinox and stereotactic body radiation in non-metastatic unresectable PDAC. In this study, patients receive upfront fulfirinox six to 12 cycles, followed by SBRT, followed by surgery. There are a number of really, um, I'd say very interesting correlatives that are multidisciplinary, um, including EUS elastography with doctors Farrell and Aslanian, CTDNA with Dr. Patel, molecular and immune feature assessment, with Drs. Cicchini, Joshi, Farrell, and Sklar, and development of pancreatic organoids with Dr. Joshi. Um, I also would like to really um, give some kudos to Dr. Michael Cicchini, who has just received his KO8. So this is really a, a beautiful combination of clinical and translational research. So the title of his ko is DNA damage as a tool to enhance the immunogenicity of cold GI tumors. His mentorship committee is listed here. Um, his aims in his ko I'll just um, read them and won't go into the detail, but it is to perform clinical trials with novel combinations of DNA damaging agents for patients with MGMT promoter hypomethylated colorectal cancer to identify predictive biomarkers for novel alkylator combinations in CRC and to assess, assess DNA damage as a tool to enhance the immunogenicity of cold colorectal tumors. Um, I'd like to end with a couple of new projects that we're working on. Um, this one is actually very exciting and I'll give a little bit of a teaser and I think Roy and Ed Kafton and I are talking about finding another forum, but we are working on a clinical trial matching project in um, GI oncology with Guanang Gong and Wade Schultz and a team to really determine if we can match patients to the clinical trial at the right time accurately, efficiently, with high volume and a project that's scalable. Other team members include Ed Kathian, Christina Weiss, myself, and Neil Fishback. We are using this clinical trial. Um, it's Michael Cicchini's temozolomide and Elaparib study as a pilot, we've selected four inclusion criteria in which Guanan and Wade and their team use natural language processing and structured data from the EMR. This is the workflow focus on the orange box and we are using um, the entry event and the pre-screening event as pilots right now. Just to give you a sense of the numbers, the, that blue top line looks at the number of visits to GI oncology department by week followed by the number of patients, unique patients to GI oncology by week, then down in gray, the number of patients with colorectal cancer, then those with metastatic stage four. And then ultimately that bottom line where you see the numbers in red range from 10 to 15 patients per week that could potentially be eligible for this clinical trial. How great would it be if you got in your inbox a list of eligible patients every week for your individual trials? So this pilot was incredibly effective and efficient. It had about a 98% accuracy rate and it really cut down on the amount of time. So before we estimated 3.11 minutes per chart for 10 week 
full-time working hours and afterwards 1.82 minutes per chart, which just equals three days of full-time working hours. So I'm really excited to see where, where this goes. Um, lastly, our Yale GI Tumor Biorepository is a real foundation for our program. This is being PI'd by, by Dr. John Kunzman and the technician Joanna Hu. It's been in existence since 2012 and we have over 1,100 patients, but it certainly has, like many things, taken a bit of a hit during COVID. John has really taken this as an opportunity to revamp and modernize. So our accrual numbers have certainly increased over time. Our biorepository is overrepresented with colon, rectal, and pancreas tumors. Um, we certainly hope to expand on this. And as I'd mentioned, John really has revamped the infrastructure. So we have an existing steering committee, but we now actually have a new location in VML. We have a brand new freezer. And um, John has completely overhauled the consent and intake process to reduce the survey length for patients and to add explicit language for modern research activities such as multiomics, cell lines and organoids and deposition of anon anonymized data in the public repositories. And we have a number of examples of active projects including a study in PDAC with UCLA and then a laparibram study um, that's a multi-institution study. So we have a number of future needs including more broader and more diverse tumor collection resumption of specimen collection in our care centers and updating our database. I'm gonna just end with a mention of um, some really exciting work that Wade Schultz and his team are doing to use a computational health platform to build an integrated clinical database. So imagine that you have all of your structured EHR data, imaging, pathology, genetics, all of these data sources you put it into a funnel, and this is a essentially a workflow. You can create curated data by the use of REDCap, and then Wade and his team create a, an integrated user interface um, so that it really minimizes redundancy of manual data entry. The CHP use cases include COVID-19, in which they were um, the teams were quite prolific. Um, hematology is just starting to launch this and integrating a number of um, key structured databases, including CBioPortal, REDCap, OMOP, genomic data, and registry data. So to end, um, you know, I think that we have a number of strengths. We have a high patient volume within our network. We have a large clinical trial and financially healthy portfolio still that we're hoping to maintain. We have an existing and expanding biorepository and strong basic and translational science. I think we have a lot of opportunities in the next one to five years, including expanding on our clinical trial portfolio with IITs. I think really investing and expanding in the biorepository. I think that will help us help lead us to better team science and then um, in the long term or medium term goals of obtaining multi PI and program project funding. So I will stop there and pass the baton to Mandar and then we'll take questions after. Right, um, thanks uh, Pam. I think we should move on to Mandar and then we'll do questions at the end. Please put your questions in the chat. I know I have a few for you, uh, but now we're very fortunate to have Mandar um, Wizumdar, um, who is assistant professor of genetics and medicine. Uh, he's part of the Yale Cancer Biology Institute. Um, so he's out at West Campus and. Um, my dream is one day we'll hold one of our grand rounds in person on West Campus. I promised that to Mark Lemon many years ago. We will hold to that. Scientific Director of the Center for Gastrointestinal Cancers uh, here at the, the hospital. And uh, just quickly, his background, um, he's also uh, has a Stanford uh, background, medical degree from Stanford, and then internship at residency at some small hospital in Boston, Brigham and Women's Hospital, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And then he completed his postdoctoral research at the Koch Institute uh, of Integrative Cancer Research at the MIT. So uh, uh, a lot more I can say about Mandra, but I will let, let you hear about his work. And um, uh, Mandra, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Roy, for the kind introduction. I just wanna build on what Dr. Coons has described and talk a little bit more about uh, challenges and opportunities in translational research, specifically in GI cancers at Yale. So I'll briefly discuss some more detailed metrics on the current state of GI cancer research at Yale, uh, and then talk about some of our goals in building translational sciences within the center 
describing four specific overarching initiatives uh, just shown here and then talk a few uh, a bit about some of the more specific initiatives that we have planned using pancreatic cancer and the Yale Pancreatic Cancer Collaborative as an example of the types of things that we're hoping for. So I'd like to start by saying that GI cancer research at Yale within the Cancer Center is prolific, high impact, and inclusive. Um, shown here are data from the Cancer Center's GI cancer-related publications over an 18-month time span from July 2019 to December 2020. And as you can see, there were uh, more than 130 publications for GI cancer-related research uh, within this 18-month time span, amounting to about 7.5 publications per month which I personally thought was quite impressive given that many of our investigators were dealing with the pandemic during this time. Importantly, more than a quarter of these publications were uh, published in high impact journals and they represented the full spectrum of diseases within the GI space, uh, including pancreatic cancers, colorectal and anal cancers, gastroesophageal and liver cancers. Furthermore, these publications included 47 individual investigators within uh, the cancer center Again, quite a diverse crew, including basic scientists, clinical and translational scientists, and epidemiologists. Now, the story is very similar for active uh, research funding, where the GI cancer portfolio includes nearly $5 million in direct costs of research funding. This is about two-thirds in peer-reviewed either NIH or competitive foundation grants, um, and the remaining from industry or non-peer-reviewed foundation grants. You can see there's a heavy uh, influx of money focused on pancreatic cancer, um, but there is a good spread across the different uh, disease programs. Additionally, this funding has uh, been accumulated by 24 independent investigators with a very similar spread in the basic clinical and translational epidemiologic space. Importantly, most of these funding sources, in fact, the vast majority are really independent grants, single investigators. And so the hope is to really le leverage this great breadth of scientific expertise, clinical care, and clinical research expertise, and try and build and synergize their efforts into teams. And that's sort of the major goal of where we're going to go with the GI Cancer Center. So again, one of our major goals is to build across disciplinary research teams that bring together clinical, translational, basic, and population health scientists with the plan to uh, allow these teams to enable team-based research grants, including multi-PI, R01s, PO1s, and SPORE grants, to try and grow investigator-initiated trials based on Yale science. Uh, Dr. Coons alluded to the fact that less than 20% of our current grants are investigator-initiated. We'd like to bump that up to at least a third, if not a half, uh, really showing sort of the importance of uh, science within Yale and, and what can result in terms of translational care. And finally, we'd like to use these teams to inspire trainees towards a career in translational GI cancer research. Dr. Coons highlighted several of our trainings doing, trainees doing really exciting uh, science within this space. We'd like to, to recruit even more to really further the, the mission in GI cancers. Ultimately, the goal is to make Yale a destination center for GI cancers, such that Yale is synonymous for outstanding, not only clinical care, but also homegrown science that translates to the clinic. Now, there are a number of challenges that get in the way of boosting translational science and GI cancers. Indeed, these are challenges that uh, Roy could speak to for thoracic or even uh, um, other cancers, and also challenges that uh, exist across the academic spectrum. And these include a lack of time, a lack of institutional resources, a lack of knowledge or expertise, or even awareness of potential collaborators within the institution. Um, and as team-based science is increasing, um, ensuring adequate recognition or opportunities for career advancement. So in terms of overarching initiatives to combat these particular challenges, we've come up with four. One is to really emphasize community building, which is hopefully to bring awareness of potential collaborators, enhance the, the community knowledge and expertise um, that can be leveraged towards team-based grants. Additionally, try to enhance research uh, education across the spectrum to try and get basic scientists to communicate with clinical scientists and vice versa, to enhance knowledge and to bring together teams. The third pillar is to develop uh, resources that's both financial in terms of grants and funding, pilot funding, 
but also institutional resources for tissue resources such as biobanks that are hard to come by and hard to leverage within individual uh, labs. And finally, we like to take advantage of these great developments and uh, disseminate it to the community using web-based or social media platforms um, as an opportunity not only to tell everyone what a great place Yale is for GI cancer research and clinical care, but also potentially to recruit outside funding to support some of these efforts. So to uh, start to chip away and sort of build some of these uh, pillars, um, a group of us started the Yale Pancreatic Cancer Collaborative uh, or Yale PAC shown here is the steering committee that includes really leaders in pancreatic cancer research and clinical care across uh, different divisions and departments, including medical oncology, radiation oncology, surgical oncology, gastroenterology, pathology, and the basic sciences. We formed the Yale PAC, which is an inclusive team of physicians, scientists, and trainees that seeks to synergize the strengths of Yale science and clinical expertise to accelerate transformative research in pancreatic cancer. To sort of nucleate the Yale PAC, we held a summit for community building last August. Um, this was a entirely virtual summit that included more than 130 participants, importantly, more than a third of whom were trainees. Uh, in participation included 16 different uh, departments uh, and three institutes. We had 16 different speakers who either were actively pursuing pancreatic cancer research initiatives or those shown in red had not prior previously been involved with pancreatic cancer research to highlight existing research as well as to engage scientists with innovative technologies that could be applied to this research space. And through these efforts, we've been able to actually generate some teams. I'll describe a few here of examples of multidisciplinary teams in GI cancers, one of which is, uh, involves our own lab in collaboration uh, with Dick Kibbe in endocrinology, and Smitha Krishnaswamy in genetics and computer science, in which we've been studying and identifying a novel intrapancreatic endocrine exocrine hormonal signaling axis that is a driver of pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma progression uh, in obesity. Luisa Escobar Hoyes in radiation therapy has partnered with Jeff Townsend in biostatistics, John Klinsman in surgery, and Nick Joshi in immunology to understand RNA splicing and tumor cell adaptation and anti tumor immunity, building off really seminal science from the Escobar Hoyes lab that identified a novel role for mutant P53 in splicing regulation in uh, pancreatic cancer. Both of these team-based grants have been recently funded by the Damon uh, Runyon Ratcliffe Innovation Award, highlighting that these team-based approaches are really uh, well-received by funding organizations and the NCI alike. The Team Challenge Awards that have been pioneered by the Cancer Center have also uh, funded several GI cancer-related teams. I'll highlight two of them here. This one led by Seth Herzon uh, in chemistry that tries to examine the molecular cancer microbiology and the underpinnings of microbiome associated carcinogenesis, building on work from Seth Herzon and collaborator Jason Crawford on synthesizing the genotoxin colibactin, which is thought to be an inducer of colorectal cancer, uh, and uh, leveraging this kind of seminal uh, preclinical uh, pre work to understand the pathogenesis by which microbiomes promote cancer, in particular colorectal cancer. And uh, another grant funded by the Team Challenge Award is, uh, includes our group in collaboration with John Wassel Mursky and Matt Rodehofer in comparative medicine, which seeks to define the effects of dietary fatty acids on breast cancer uh, and pancreatic cancer progression, leveraging innovative uh, high fat diets that Matt Rodehofer's group has developed that uh, represent the diversity of diets found in human cancers and trying to identify effects on host physiology as well as on tumor progression. And you can see there's a diversity of effects on pancreatic cancer progression using these diets. Beyond building uh, teams, we've also been interested in educating these teams on the latest and greatest advances in uh, basic science and uh, clinical and translational uh, science uh, by forming the Yale Pancreatic Cancer Collaborative Seminar Series. This included uh, an outstanding cadre of investigators, um, principally outside of Yale, uh, who uh, encompass that breadth of basic to clinical science um, as shown here and was an opportunity for our community to learn about uh, the advances of pancreatic cancer research and care and to try and build upon some of what has already come before us and 
really understand the unmet needs in this space and how Yale could position itself to meet these particular needs. Uh, another uh, core uh, initiative for our group is to really build resource development. Dr. Coons highlighted the GI Cancer Biobank, which is actually quite prolific, includes a large uh, number of samples in, the, in pancreatic cancer and colorectal cancer and specifically. And beyond expanding this to other cancers uh, in the GI uh, space, um, we've also been working closely with our uh, co collaborators in surgery, Yale Pathology and Lab Medicine to develop new living cancer models based on these prospective collection of samples. These include uh, uh, patient-derived xenografts and patient-derived organoids uh, with the hope of developing and molecularly characterizing some of these very precious tissues. Now, importantly, Many of these tissues are quite limited, particularly in diseases like pancreatic cancer, where the tumor fraction is quite low. And so we need to be able to leverage emerging technologies that are able to garner a large quantity of information from small and scarce samples. And so to that end, um, our collaborative has tried to uh, bring together innovative scientists such as Stephen Wang in genetics and Ron Fang in biomedical engineering, who developed uh, interesting multi-omics technologies that allow spatial analysis of gene expression, protein expression, and even 3D genome organization um, in very scarce tissue-based samples. And so we're excited of the possibility of taking advantage of the biobank to do deep molecular characterization to build resources that can be leveraged for to address particular questions that our investigators uh, might have. And finally, I think it's important for us to be able to uh, expand and let the community know about our translational science efforts. Um, shown here are, are, is the Breakthroughs uh, magazine this year that highlighted the team building that we've done in the pancreatic cancer space. And shown here also is the ability to use Twitter to really uh, expand our reach of our center and in hopes of not only educating the community, uh, but also potentially to, as a fundraising mechanism in the future. So what are some of the future specific plans we have in mind to meet these initiatives? One is we'd like to expand the activities we've done in pancreatic cancer uh, to the other centers to focus on community building through uh, a similar types of summits or seminar series across our core programs. We'd also like to develop some cross program initiatives within the center. Uh, importantly, we want to focus on physician scientist recruitment in GI cancers. I think they serve as in the uh, Center for Molecular and Cellular Oncology, which is actively pursuing uh, junior physician scientist recruits. Uh, and we hope to be able to bring in more um, who have a real focus in GI cancers. Um, we also want to try and bridge the gap between basic and clinical scientists. And to do that, uh, we're gonna try and um, launch the Doctors In series. This is a series to allow clinicians to educate basic researchers on the diagnosis, treatment, and importantly, the unmet needs for specific cancers. Not only this will these be important community building events, but also an opportunity to educate our basic science community on the challenges faced in the clinic. We want to include basic and translational research talks into the CME events uh, within our community that Dr. Coons uh, described, um, again, as an education uh, initiative, but also an opportunity for outreach. Uh, we want to facilitate team-based uh, grant funding, um, in particular trying to take advantage of internal support such as TCA, the uh, Team Challenge Award or the TTER grants, and ultimately to direct these teams and support these teams administratively toward developing more program project grants such as PO1s and SPORs. We want to increase the accessibility and molecular characterization of biobank samples. Dr. Coons described some events, um, some initiatives on the computational side. Um, we also want to leverage some of the multi-omics technologies. And finally, we want to fundraise towards the center and disease programs to support this translational research. Clearly, to be able to build these teams and provide private uh, pilot funding, some amount of philanthropy is going to be required. And to do that, we want to create a unified Twitter and website uh, presence to really unify the center, but also to make key announcements of advances in translational science within our center. And so with that, uh, we're happy to take any questions. Thank you both. Uh, that was absolutely wonderful. Um, we'll we'll put some uh, some questions in in the chat. So um, maybe I'll start. You know, for you, Pam, can you speak a little bit about? You talked about screening uh, for colorectal cancer. Can you talk about um, what the current guidelines are and, and how we're addressing that here at 
Yes, my own. And also the whole health equity issue around this. How are we making sure that all patients are, are getting in for a screening? So, so at present, the recommended screening age is still 50. Um, the, the USPSTF guidelines, um, the draft has not been accepted into practice just yet. So what um, I will say, I have an in since my husband is a gastroenterologist in the community, but he has said, and I think this is appropriate, that we recommend that if patients who are between the ages of 45 and 49 are interested, that they check with their insurance company first. I mean, I anticipate that this will in fact be adopted and then we will have a considerable education to do. And I think that partnering with um, Xavier Yor and this the colorectal cancer program, Xavier and I and his team, we talked a lot about outreach and, and how we can improve our efforts in that space. Well, you mentioned you're using Wade's database. Are you able to look through that database? Are the patients that you're screening uh, representing the community in general? Or are there areas to enhance? So we, we are just starting working with Wade, but that's an excellent idea. Um, and I think ways that we can leverage that and also with, with Marcella Nunes-Smith. Great. Uh, Mandar, why is pancreatic cancer so difficult to, to, to treat? You know, you have these new, uh, these, these new uh, uh, approaches, but immunotherapy, it doesn't seem to work as well there as uh, in many of the other cancers. Uh, what's the reason for that? Yeah, I think there's a, a number of kind of unique features of pancreatic cancer in particular that make it particularly challenging for therapeutics. In the immunotherapy space, it's well known that pancreatic cancer has a quite a bit of a different stromal microenvironment. Uh, in particular, it's thought that this microenvironment made up of fibroblasts, immune cells like macrophages in particular, as well as extracellular matrix proteins can be quite immunosuppressive. Um, and even in mismatch repair deficient pancreatic cancers, the response rates are quite a bit lower than, for example, what we'd see in colorectal cancer suggesting that there's something unique about the intrinsic biology of, of pancreatic cancer. And I think the stroma quite, uh, plays quite a bit of a role. Importantly, pancreatic cancer is uh, genetically fairly bland. Um, it gets four hallmark recurrent genetic alterations, in particular in the proto-oncogene KRAS and three other tumor suppressor genes. So in terms of targetable genetic alterations, there are few. And even within KRAS mutations, the currently targetable one, G12C mutations are quite rare, only found in about two to 3%. And our own data suggested that even if you had a perfect KRAS inhibitor, resistance is likely to emerge in at least half of the cases. And so I think there are a number of factors that lead to the poor outcomes of pancreatic cancer. And I think one aspect that deserves more attention is prevention in the disease. Um, you know, one of the one of the key factors to poor outcomes is often late stage of diagnosis, where more than 80% of patients uh, are found at a time when they're not surgically resectable, which really is the mainstay curative option in this disease. And so what can we do to understand uh, when this disease emerges? Can we intervene earlier? Can we identify earlier disease? And can we even develop strategies for prevention by understanding risk factors, for example, how they play a role? And that's sort of driven some of our own efforts in the obesity uh, pancreatic cancer space. Are there genetic risks as well? Uh, if we were to use big data AI approaches, do you think we'd find some, some uh, genomic factors that might tell us who might need, need to be screened earlier? Yeah, there are a number of genetic factors that have been um, identified. Only about 10% of pancreatic cancers are thought to be familial in nature. And a subset of those uh, patients will have known genetic alterations. And our uh, screening clinic here, led by James Farrell, is focused on that uh, in trying to follow these familial cases, um, not only in terms of genetics, but also to understand other risk factors, such as new onset diabetes. And it turns out about 1% of pancreatic cancer cases can be identified with new onset diabetes. Could we use that as a biomarker of sort of early detection? And so there are a number of avenues that people are exploring and certainly big data type approaches that mirror, that match clinical, prior clinical history to pancreatic cancer development. Again, maybe taking advantage of uh, EMR mining like Wade Schultz is doing could help identify some of those patients and identify other risk factors. And there are a number of groups, including the Dana-Farber group that is trying to build risk scores that combine both genetics as well as non-genetic factors uh, to truly, to determine who are, are perhaps the most highest risk. 
And finally, I think we still need to further optimize what are uh, the best screening protocols. Is it a combination of endoscopic ultrasound, imaging, blood-based biomarkers? All of those are active areas of investigation. We have a few questions. So Pam, you're very modest. I actually am waiting to see how you do the GI program and I'll model uh, the lung program after you. You just fantastic. And I, I have to just compliment you coming here during this very difficult year and pulling this amazing group together between the campuses. And I, I, I just think it's remarkable. And I guess Zoom has helped a little bit, but hopefully at some point we'll all see each other in person. But how do you clinically with care ongoing at 15 different care centers and I was impressed by that picture where you show all the different people. How are you uh, putting practice plans in place and, and knowing that someone who goes to North Haven versus someone that goes to Greenwich or main campus is getting the same sort of approach and, and care for one of these diseases? That, that's a great question. You know, I'd say that um, the first step has been creating forums where our, our team members all get together. And I have to say that um, we've had just really tremendous virtual attendance. And I think that's one silver lining of the Zoom format is that we have you know, 30 to 40 people attending tumor board, averaging 40 patients attending our seminar series. And those that's really community building. I, I think Mandar spoke to that as well. And I think as soon as we have that as a foundation, it creates other opportunities for collaboration. Um, Jill Lacey is our director of education in our leadership cabinet. And I know that um, well, I, she's told me this, so I think I can say this, but I think she's, she and I and the team are really eager to um, work on that signature of care and, and talking, that's why we have journal clubs. We talk about standard practices very openly with all of our team members. And we have really tremendous um, participation from our care center members. And you know I think that's helped by Jeremy Kormansky really being an integral part of our team. He has been for a long time. And I think in his new role, that's helping as well. Uh, absolutely. Um, we're just at the end of the hour, any other questions or comments? Um, one thing I'll ask, you mentioned it, you mentioned Jill Lacey, I'll ask both of you. I see a lot of fellows on the line. Uh, one, of the, one of the groups is fellows room. So I guess they're hopefully getting us some lunch in there. If not, let me know for next week. But, but the question is, do you have projects? You know, our fellows, and we have great fellows, medical students, there might even be some undergraduates listening. I don't, anyone, are there projects? How, how would someone find a project in GI Cancer Mandar if they wanted to work in the lab or between the lab and the clinic or PAM in the clinic? Uh, can you let us know? Yeah, I think one of our goals is to make very accessible, shovel-ready projects for uh, people with limited time, medical students, residents, fellows. Um, and I think there are a couple of advantages that, yeah, one is the biobank, which is quite expansive, particularly in, again, pancreatic cancer and colorectal cancer that might allow tissue-based analyses that might be more efficient. The second is we have a large number of patients, particularly in the pancreatic cancer space, that we followed for many years. And so some of the st uh, studies, for example, what Dr. Patel has done is based on those types of retrospective analyses and this clinical database that we have in GI cancers. And so again, those types of projects uh, are probably much more numerous and we need to make those uh, clearer and make them more shovel ready so that uh, we can get our trainees involved uh, quickly. Any, any, any final Roy, Roy, I'll just, yeah, I'll, if I can just add, Roy, you know, we had our, one of our program directors meetings last week and we as a, those four programs, all the co-leaders identified as our next top priority doing just that of really developing this list as we have new trainees coming in in July and having that available. Right, and, and you guys are great. I'll say one big part of the shovel is the handle, which is the mentorship. And on these projects, you don't wanna have a good idea, but you know, it's, it's, I can tell you from my own career, it's having mentors and people that help you. So I can see you have that and plenty of that in the GI group. We we'll look forward to having you back in six months or so uh, to hear more progress, maybe bring some other members of the group. But this has been a fantastic Grand Rounds today. We'll look forward to your first uh, Grand Rounds for the GI program with an invited guest from Puerto Rico in two weeks. Uh, and um, thank you all. Thanks everyone for coming today. And we'll see you back next week for uh, Cancer Center Grand Rounds. Thank you, Pam and Manda. Thank you. Thanks.